I invite you to go ahead and take a seat. Thank you, band, for leading us in worship. My name is Jake Bessling. As Pastor Anthony said, I've been with you maybe twice before, and it's an honor to be with you to share God's Word today. I serve as campus pastor at Concordia University in Texas, and uh, as you're going through this series, I I just love this series, encountering these different characters, different real-life people, that Jesus changes their life. And today we see Jesus outside of the temple on a Sabbath, interacting with a man born blind. And so let's check in at John chapter 9. Um, This is a long passage, so buckle up, 41 verses. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with his saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So we went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. That's me. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Well, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. So the Pharisees again asked him with him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I wash and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight until they called the parents of the man who had received a sight and asked them, is this your son who was saying that he was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner about Jesus, I do not know. One thing I do know that I was blind and now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, 
you were born in utter sin and you would teach us? And they casted him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and they had then, having found him, he said, do you believe? Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? (laughs) Jesus said to them, if you are blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The word of the Lord for you. I feel like I should have taken a um, half time in that, right? Oh, it's good to be with you this morning. I want to take you back for a moment, though, to my childhood. And uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas. And I remember one night we were at church uh, till about 2 a.m., kind of a mini lock in. And then I went home and I fell asleep. And when my eyes went from dark to light and I, I woke up, I saw my parents. And I saw some paramedics around the bed um, in my house. And I said, what's going on? I don't remember. I mean, I was sleeping, right? And they said, no, you had just had a seizure. And my mom recounted to me that that awful motherly feeling of seeing her son just start to shake uncontrollably for about two to three minutes. And so um, I was diagnosed with epilepsy and then for the next couple of years had a series of tests through epilepsy and medicine and all all of those things. But when I hit a story like this, I can't help but think then in the question that the disciples had. What was it? It would be like this for me. Who sinned, Jake? Or his parents? That he would now have epilepsy. You get my drift? See where I'm going there? I mean, a a story in my life recently, pretty tragic, is where I used to pastor in Arizona. Some of the kids that, that grew up Now in their 20s, married, having their first child, painting the room, getting ready for the child. Uh, Carly, she's 36 weeks pregnant, and she finds out, why is my baby not moving anymore? But my baby is is dead. And Carly and Seth, recently then, my friends, they had to go into the hospital to deliver their baby, hold their baby, and now bury their baby. And, And as horrible as that is, in the midst of that, it would be the disciples in this text that would look at that situation and ask, well, who sinned? Did Carly and Seth or did their parents somewhere that that God would do this to them? And I don't know what it is in in your life, but maybe there's someone suffering, there's something going on that you're you're starting to question, like, how how could this be? It's It's a couple that can't have kids, or on Memorial Day weekend, it's a soldier that goes off to war and dies for their country, and we're thinking, this is crazy, why are these things happening? Someone gets diagnosed with breast cancer, someone is persecuted because of the color of their skin or their religion, or they're born without a, com- without a common physical ability that someone else has. And in the text, the disciples would ask the question, Who sinned in the situation, that person or someone in their family? Friends, I think the disciples might just be asking the wrong question. Would you agree? It's got to be the wrong question as I've studied this. Now, they're on the right track in that there are people in our world that suffer. And maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I, I could teach you, Jake, about suffering. And I'd love to hear your story. Does anyone know someone suffering right now? Just kind of nod your head if you know someone out there suffering, right? Uh, Maybe someone's even distant from you or you don't know them, but you see it and they're suffering. There's there's war going on. There's suffering in our world. And we start to have some questions with that, don't we? Why is this happening? When will it end? How come this won't stop? Um, Will there be a miracle? We ask all sorts of questions, at least I do, but I think a better question is coming today. Just buckle up and hang in there, and I'll give it to you. Bethany, you've made it. It's, it's chapter 9 of John. Yay! Nine chapters in, 
And let's go through this story a little bit as we just read it and heard it. And I want to break down just the first like six verses. Here's how it starts. Would you say it out loud with me? Would you read it? As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples then asked him. So we'll stop there. Let's pause and I would like to invite you to just close your eyes. Picture in your head then, embodying this man outside of the temple born blind. You have never seen a sunrise or sunset. You've never actually seen the color of your mom or dad's eyes. You're used to begging outside the temple. It's a Saturday Sabbath for the Jews and you're, you're hoping that you will get enough money to get the daily bread that you want. You're not married. No one will hardly talk to you. You're an outcast in the society. You didn't go to school. You were rejected by your own people. And then you begin to hear Jesus talking and you begin to hear his disciples say these words about you. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I invite you to open up your eyes. Do you remember Full House? Remember Full House? You remember the youngest child in Full House? She'd always say, how rude. Can you say that? How rude. That's a how rude moment, isn't it? If you're the blind person and, and the disciples are talking about you but not talking to you and this is what they say hey jesus who sinned this person or their family that they would be this way that they would have the label of them on them that he wouldn't be able to see get the drift get where where we're headed there how rude this is classic disciples needing to learn the way of love and the way of jesus he goes on then to answer this right um this is how he answers this this question. He, Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I didn't like, did you like the options that the disciples gave Jesus? It was just two, right? You know, this is either a, a bad man or a good man. This is either a bad family situation or a good family situation. Um, This is probably a sinner or a worse sinner. He he doesn't give them, the disciples doesn't give them many options. They're myopically thinking. They're thinking in terms of their own way and their own thoughts, not thinking above that to God and the way God might be thinking about the situation. But Jesus answers it plainly. Neither this man nor his parents sin. I love Jesus, just shooting straight. He's saying, this man is a sinner, but this is not about sin. For all have fallen short of the glory of God, but this thing that he's going through is not about sin. It's not a direct connotation to sin. The, the, the man or the family didn't do anything wrong, but why is this happening? But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. There it is. Jesus wants the disciples to know know that they're wrong. No, this is not about sin. No, this is not about sin. No, this is not about sin. But I've got a higher upper story going on. Mind blown. I don't know about you, but for me, when I face suffering or heartache or illness or tragedy, I I just want to fix it or I want to yell at God. I, I, I do not have perspective that maybe... This is happening so that the works of God might be displayed in this situation. And I can see it in your eyes right now. I mean, there's probably stories behind suffering. This can be a difficult subject to to really grapple with or, or talk about. I remember 10 years ago being at a church where two pastors just differed on how they saw suffering for the Christian. And they even started to, to debate it in an unhealthy way. That's not what this is about today. Because I want to leave you with three things. I hope you grow in your empathy to those that are suffering. Or maybe someone would grow in empathy to you if you're suffering. Number two, um, that you would be able to see your suffering in a totally different way to answer a, a different type of question. And three, you would get clarity from the Bible on the different categories of what happens when we 
suffer. Jesus seems to be saying, though, that there's something more going on here with our suffering. He says, actually, he closes this up a little bit and says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. So Jesus is there saying, like, I'm right here. I can do the miracle. I can be the kingdom for you. I'm right here. Trust in me. Because while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That I can take people that can't see and brighten their eyes and do a miracle in their life. When I was researching for this sermon, I was running across a theologian, a preacher, and he started to say, we really need to talk about this text in contemporary terms to see that in our world today, a lot of times it's karma or it's kingdom. Karma or kingdom. Any Taylor Swift fans? I'm a Taylor Swift fan, but like she sings about karma, right? And I don't know where she lands with that, but it's just a word I wanted to talk about today. In Eastern religion, karma is a big thing. That if you do good, that means good things are going to happen. If you do bad, that means bad things are going to happen. And if you are suffering, it means because in another lifetime, for some religions, in another lifetime, you did something wrong, your family did something wrong, and now you're paying that forward in the next life. And so if we are seeing the suffering, we're just going to be at a distance. Like, that's their fault because they deserve it. So I can't mess with that. I can't help that person. And the disciples are falling into that trap of thinking in a karma type of way. Well, who sinned? This man or their family. And and Jesus wants to kind of bring their eyes up and out to the kingdom of God. So karma work? No. Kingdom work going on right before their very eyes. Jesus says the issue, man, it is not karma. It's not about sin. It's about the suffering but then what God can do in the midst of that, of that. At this moment, what I would like you to do is, as we think about this story of this actual person in John 9, if you can, turn to someone next to you and look into their eyes. <laughs> All right, do it now, please. <laughs> and if you don't have anyone near you, just, just try to find someone, but I'll see you. Like, look into someone's eyes right now. I know this could be the most awkward thing you've ever done in church with a guest preacher. And then you can look up here. But think about that. A lot of times we don't look into each other's eyes, do we? We just kind of gloss over it. We don't really deeply look. And when you look in someone's eyes, as I did at communion today, I was like, man, I am getting connected to someone. There's a connection here. And In this story, Jesus changes this man's life who had never seen eyeball to eyeball and he goes to wash and he starts to see again. Yet in the categories that the disciples had, they had to pin this man down still with the fact that they think he sinned. So I want to expand our horizons today through the Bible, eyeball to eyeball, to think of other categories. The first category, though, and I'll list them up there, is sin. Everyone say sin. That sometimes in our life, we sin, we do something wrong, and then we suffer, right? We, we, um, we lie and we cheat, and then there's a consequence. We gamble, and then we try to cover up the gambling with more gambling, and then the, the spouse doesn't know about it, and then they find out about it because there's cheating involved, and then there's suffering. These, that's not me, by the way, okay? <laughs> These things happen. There's chronic abuse. It goes on. There's suffering. In this situation, though, there's, a, there's suffering, and Jesus is like, this is not about sin in this situation. The second category you can find in the Bible, I would say, is broken world. Romans chapter 8 says that it's a broken world. We're not in the Garden of Eden anymore where it's perfect. Romans 8 says that our bodies and the world is groaning for what? Restoration. Did anyone wake up this morning with pain and say, I need restoration, right? Getting older, can't see as well, can't hear as well, pain in the joints. The world around us, though, the wars, the different things going on, even within the the, the soil and the, the, the climate, it's groaning for restoration. That's another category of suffering. Third one, demonic. Everyone say demonic. Demonic. 
When you look at the story of Job, it's a demonic story. Satan goes before God and says, hey, who is like the righteous of all righteous that I can tempt? And the the Lord allows this to take place in Job's life. Job has everything taken from him, and yet he grapples with why is this happening, and he, he tries his best to praise God in the midst of the demonic situation. It's interesting in that story that in our life, we think maybe, man, I'm doing pretty well. I'm a good person. Good should happen. That's karma. With Job, he's the most righteous, and yet he faces suffering. That's another category of suffering within the Bible. Another one is victim. Everyone say victim. Victim. Someone else sins, and then people are affected by that sin, and there's victims. Someone is a victim of someone else's choice. Gypsy Rose was a victim, if you know that story, of her mom's delusions. The Jews were victims of Hitler's hate and ethnocentrism. There are victims all around us based on the sin of other people, and you can find that through the Word of God as well. The last one, though, the fifth category that has helped me in my ministry the most is that a lot of times suffering is mysterious. Everyone say mysterious. 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 Sometimes you get into a situation, maybe you've been there before, and you're like, I just don't get it. You ever been there? It's a mystery of why God is doing and allowing what God is allowing. The worst ministry day I've had in my 20 years of being a pastor and a youth minister and all that stuff is when I stood over a 10-year-old that had died um, and the parents are just wailing, crying out. And I didn't have any answers. All I could do is be silent and somewhat join in with them. Why? 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 And maybe you have a why story. Why did I lose that spouse so early? Why was I diagnosed in that way? Why was I born with those thoughts or those desires? And in a couple of weeks, you're going to go through a series on the Psalms where God gives us complete permission to cry out to him with all of our emotion, cry out to him with our whys. Even Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet I know as I counsel people and I'm in people's lives and shepherding them through that, maybe you have this story too, you really want your whys to turn into the hows. In the time of suffering, why to how? How can God use my suffering for his glory? Would you whisper that question to me? How can God use my suffering for his glory? God gives us a promise in Romans chapter 5. He gave a promise to that man born blind. For we all know that glory, we can glory in our sufferings. That's, that's wild. We can glory, have glory, have have glory to God in our sufferings, not once it's over, not after the fact, but in suffering, because we know that suffering does something. It produces fruit. Perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Jesus has died, yes, friends, and he's walked out of the grave, and that's the reality we can lean into suffering, in that suffering, to say, wow, how could God use this for his glory? To give us even hope. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is kingdom work. God says this happens so the work of God would actually be displayed in and through the suffering and the miracle to come. And for some of us, man, that miracle isn't coming. It hasn't come, but the miracle will come when Jesus returns to make all things new, to give us all sight, to, to care for all of us physically by resurrecting our bodies. And hope is on the way. But today you can know that there was one that suffered for you. Amen. 
that there is a cross in this sanctuary because Jesus, the perfect one that had no blemish, took on your sin and my sin so that when we ask the wrong questions or we doubt what God is up to and we actually sin equals suffering, we would be told again and again that you are loved, that I don't hold that sin against you, that as far as the east is from the west, I've removed that transgression from you. Look to Jesus today, the suffering one that stoops down to make mud and open a blind guy's eyes. The coolest part of this story to me is when it talks about them never having seen something like this, even in the world. In the Old Testament, how many times do you think, there are stories in the Old Testament all over these miracles, right? Parting waters and staff becoming snakes. How many times in the Old Testament do you think a blind person receives their sight? How many times? 50 maybe? 25, don't say the right answer. Zero. You've seen this twice. Come on now. That's crazy. I mean, I read these stories since I was a little kid. I'm like, man, Jesus is just walking around making people see. It has to happen in the Old Testament. There's incredible miracles in the Old Testament. No, it's not recorded there because the Old Testament said there would be one that would come who would take those that have never seen the face of a sunrise or the face of their parents and he would help them to see physically. That's incredible. And that's your Jesus. And that's my Jesus. And that's the Jesus that asks you now, when you go through suffering, church, how can God use your suffering for his glory? Maybe it's to encourage someone who thinks they have it worse. And you can say, I I relate in suffering though. Maybe it's to draw you closer to the book of John that you're studying where it's like, man, there's nothing else that I can even cling to but the stories of Jesus. Maybe it's in suffering to to help you get a kingdom perspective of what Jesus actually went through on the cross. Maybe it's to teach you a hard lesson. And maybe it's because a miracle will come this side of eternity. I don't know. But when you go through those times, I just made a list for you to think about the promises of God that you can hold on to. The next time you go through suffering, if you agree with these promises I say, would you just say amen, and I'll I'll prompt you on that, that when you go through suffering, know that you are more than conquerors through Christ who gives you strength. If you agree, say amen. That, That God works for the good of those who love him, and he loved us first, and we love him. If you agree, say amen. When you go through suffering, you can know that, man, this is so hard to know, but God, your ways are higher than my ways. I trust in your plan. If you agree, say amen. And you can remember in suffering that through the waters of baptism, your blind eyes were opened to see Jesus. If you agree, say amen. And when next time you go through suffering, you might ask why, 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 but maybe you also say, Lord, how? How might I use this suffering, whatever it is, big or small, for your glory? In Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, what a mystery on this Trinity Sunday, but yet we know that you parent us through the suffering. And Lord, if a miracle is coming for those in this space, Lord, like give it to them, Lord. Heal it, heal heal something going on in their life, Lord, so that it would glorify you. And yet, Lord, if for your mysterious ways it's going to have to be different and they have to wait for the eternal kingdom to see that miracle come, give them strength. And anything in between, Lord, give us hope upon hope that because you walked out of the grave, you've got us. You're in control. In Jesus' name.